Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 4th, and there are 44 days until spring. Today, we celebrate a botanist who helped us understand why plants are green, chlorophyll. And we'll also learn about the dedicated landscape architect who is a protege of Beatrix Ferrand. We'll hear some tips for keeping a well-stocked winter larder. And we grow that garden library today with a 2021 journal that you can use to keep track of your year in the garden. And it has some fantastic original sketches from a garden great on nearly every page. And then we'll wrap things up with the story that helps us see weedy plants through a different lens. And we're fools if we can't be more balanced in our perspective on these plants. But first, I just want to remind you, if you have a second, to head on over to podchaser.com and leave a review for the show. Put that on your to-do for the week. And then if you haven't yet, head on over to the website for the show, thedailygardener.org. That's where you'll find all of the show notes for every single episode. You'll also be able to peruse all of the botanical history. All of the little snippets that you've heard on the show are right there the botanical poetry, all the books that I've recommended. It is a smorgasbord of the Daily Gardener podcast just waiting for you right there. And then finally, when you're on the website, you'll see a sign up where you can join the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. You just sign up there and then every Friday you'll get a little garden note from me That'll give you some more botanical history and literature to get you through the weekend, along with a lot of other lovely little tidbits. If you have any gardener greetings that you'd like to send and have me read on the show, you can do that by sending me an email at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. All right, here's today's curated news. Today's curated news is from a blog that's called That Bloomin' Garden, and this post was written by Kristen Crouch, and I'm sharing it because I know there are a lot of you who are brand new to gardening, no doubt thanks to the pandemic or to a new move or to an inherited garden that you might have acquired recently, and you may be starting seeds for the very first time, and Kristen did a wonderful job of introducing seed starting for beginners. So if you want to check out that article, you can do so very easily in the Facebook group for the show. Just search for the word seeds and Kristen's post will pop right up. And that's why I do this. I share it all in the Facebook group so that you don't have to track these things down. They're very easy to find, but you do have to join the group. That's the only way you're going to find this stuff because it's a private group. And I know on occasion, some of you have commented that you wish the things that I share in the group were shareable. And sadly, they're not because the group is a private group. I want you to feel like it's a comfortable place where you can share freely without having everyone in the world see what you're posting in the group. You don't have to worry about that in this particular Facebook group, but it does make it difficult sometimes if you see something you like because it's not shareable. So I understand it's a it's a put and a take there. But if you want to join the Facebook group, I, and I hope that you consider doing that, it's so easy to join. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar and type in Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the French botanist and physiologist Henri Dutrochet, who died on this day, December 4th in 1847. After studying the movement of sap in plants in his home laboratory, Henry discovered and named osmosis, and Henry shared his discovery with the Paris Academy of Sciences on October 30th, 1826. So we've known about osmosis for nearly 200 years. Like the cells in our own bodies, plants don't drink water. They absorb it 
through osmosis. Henry also figured out that the green pigment or chlorophyll in a plant is essential to how plants take up carbon dioxide. Hence, photosynthesis could not happen without chlorophyll. And it turns out chlorophyll actually helps plants gather the energy from light. And if you've ever asked yourself why plants are green, the answer is chlorophyll. Since it reflects green light, the chlorophyll makes the plant appear green. As for Henry, he was a true pioneer in plant research. Henry Dutrochet was the very first person to examine plant respiration, light sensitivity, and geotropism. Geotropism is how the plant responds to gravity, which means that roots grow down to the ground. Now, I remember helping my kids learn about geotropism, and it can be confusing at first, but I just think of it this way. The upward growth of plants, meaning you're fighting against gravity, is called negative geotropism. You're fighting against gravity. And then the downward growth of roots going with gravity is called positive geotropism. So when we get along with gravity, we're positive. And when we're trying to fight it, growing up, it's negative. And there's a little part of the plant at the very end of the root that responds to positive geotropism, and it's called the root cap. So what makes the roots grow downward? Well, it's that small but mighty root cap. It's responding to positive geotropism. And today is the birthday of the Beatrix Ferrand protege, the American landscape architect Ruth Harvey, who was born on this day, February 4th in 1899. After graduating from Smith College, Ruth attended the first landscape architecture school to allow women, the Cambridge School of Domestic and Landscape Architecture. Now, before she earned her master's degree in architecture, Ruth had already started working for Beatrix, and it was this relationship that would lead Ruth to her professional destiny, Dumbarton Oaks. Dumbarton Oaks was a farm that was purchased by Robert and Mildred Bliss in 1920. A great creative visionary, Mildred immediately had big plans for the property, and she hired the great landscape architect Beatrix Ferrand to help with the transformation. And while Mildred had bargained for creating a magnificent garden property, she ended up with so much more, a very dear friendship with Beatrix. As for Ruth, after she was hired, she joined a small team of women that was spearheaded by Beatrix to design the magnificent gardens and landscape at Dumbarton. But in a few years after the project was underway, it was Ruth who took point on the work there. And her leadership happened organically after she proved herself by working on various projects. In fact, Ruth's first major project at Dumbarton was something called the Green Garden Inscription to Beatrix Ferrand. The inscribed stone tablet was something special that Mildred wanted to be added to the green terrace. She was looking for a permanent way to honor her dear friend Beatrix, and she wanted it set in stone. And so Ruth designed a plaque that was placed within a balustrade, the stone railing of the terrace. And it was written in Latin, and the inscription basically translates this way. It has two lines of elegy that read, May they see their dreams springing to life under the spreading boughs. May lucky stars bring them every continuous good. And then the inscription reads, 
a testimony to the friendship of Beatrix Ferrand, Robert Bliss and his wife Mildred, remembering those who have spent their lives bringing truth forth for a later age, set this plaque here. The Green Terrace was designed to be an extension of the Bliss home. The patio area served as an outdoor dining room and a space for entertaining, and the Blisses hosted large parties and events there. Set on the highest part of the property, the Green Terrace offers the very best views of Dumbarton and the spot where Mildred purposefully chose the inscription. It's the very best spot to stand to view the garden and the landscape beyond. Over Ruth Harvey's long career, she took on additional projects out of her office in New York, and she was part of the first generation of working female landscape architects in the country. And with every project she completed, Ruth honed her superpower, which was tying the landscape to buildings on the property, making the garden a cohesive part of the whole. And although she had many impressive clients and gardens through the years, Ruth always felt a special bond with Dumbarton, a place she helped to mold and shape for over 30 years. And it's fitting that her very best work, her masterpiece, was a Dumbarton project called the Pebble Garden. Now, initially, the Pebble Garden space was a tennis court, and Beatrix Ferrand had actually installed it. Now, most gardeners can relate to tearing out a garden feature that no longer suits their needs. But the task of replacing a tennis court, a 60 by 120 foot flat space with an intricate pebble mosaic, must have felt like an enormous undertaking. The area was a clean slate. After a fateful trip to Florence, Italy, Mildred discovered a muse for the space. She'd gone to see the Villa Itati, and Mildred's imagination lighted up when she saw an intricate mosaic of pebbles, a pebble garden that made the walkways look like they were covered with an intricately patterned stone carpet. Now, Villa Itati's elaborate pebble pathways were designed by the great Uruguayan British garden designer and architect Cecil Ross Pinsett. Visiting elite gardens was not at all intimidating or overwhelming to Mildred. Instead, Mildred was invigorated by the practice of benchmarking the very best gardens in the world so that Dumbarton, too, could be extraordinary. Imagine being in Ruth's shoes as Mildred tells her she wants a pebble mosaic to replace the tennis court. Imagine sourcing images for inspiration, finding the perfect pebbles, and establishing a design that would likely inspire for centuries. This redesign was a massive challenge for Ruth Harvey, and in the end, she nailed it. And the pride that she must have felt was likely very gratifying. Today, when you view Ruth's pebble mosaic, I want you to imagine what it would have looked like with water above it, because that was what she had originally intended. But sadly, the cement bedding below the mosaic had some flaws, and those cracks meant that the mosaic would always be fully exposed. And I suspect that this development has actually prolonged the life of the mosaic. Anyone with a water feature knows how water degrades the structures beneath the water. Finally, the pebble garden features two cornucopias on either side of a large sheaf of grain. This harvest image of the two cornucopias in the grain is a visual reminder of the Bliss family motto, 
you reap what you sow. In Unearthed Words, today's words are by Georgianne Brennan, who's an author and a co-founder of the Lumarche Seed Company. These are the words from her winter section of her book, Potager, and she's writing about the traditional winter larder. Harvested fruits and vegetables can be stored over winter in a number of ways. Perishable summer stone fruits can be dried, packed into sweetened alcohol syrups, or cooked into preserves or jellies. The palm fruits, apples, pears, and quinces from late summer and early fall harvest will keep for several months in a cool, dark, well-ventilated place, as well as hard squashes and winter roots. Brine or salt-cured olives and a variety of nuts and dried beans make up the remainder of a traditional winter larder. Salty anchovies and olives from the larder go surprisingly well with winter's starchy potatoes and storage onions. And all kinds of dried beans are good in slow-simmered dishes, especially if the beans were harvested the preceding fall and still retain their fresh flavor. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Bunny Melon Garden Journal by Linda Holden. This journal came out in 2020, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Mine arrived last week, and I couldn't be more delighted with it. In this journal, Linda added many lovely little bunny melon touches. There are Bunny's wonderful sketches, along with quotes about gardening and life. And Linda thoughtfully alternated blank and lined pages, honoring every gardener's need to draw and write. This journal is perfect for the garden designer as well as the gardener. And I think that the sweet little sketches throughout the journal are incredibly inspiring. Each drawing and doodle is taken from notes and letters that Bunny wrote to her friends and family. Linda's journal features an elastic band closure, an inside pocket, and a ribbon bookmark, making this journal a lovely keepsake and a handy reference for whenever you like to journal. You can get a copy of A Bunny Melon Garden Journal by Linda Holden and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $7. And if you forget to order it, I will be including it in this Friday's newsletter. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, February 4th in 1995, that the North County Times ran a little article about weeds. And it starts out with this question. What do yarrow, chicory, horsetail, shepherd's purse, and ground ivy have in common? Well, in case you haven't guessed, the answer is that they are all considered weeds. Yet the author of Just Weeds, Pamela Jones, counters this way. I would like to see the word weed abolished altogether for being one of the most intolerant negative words in the English language. Pamela's book features insights on the uses, medicinal and otherwise, of 30 different weeds, and she also shares the lore and history of each plant. The part of the yarrow that grows above the ground has been used to treat everything from fever and cold to tummy troubles and toothaches. And chicory is known as the herb for perseverance. I always think of the little chicory flower blooming through a crack along the side of a highway I saw one time. It was such a great example of determination. And that's how I always remember that chicory is the herb for perseverance. 
And all parts of the chicory are useful for both medicine and food. And then there's horsetail milkweed or Asclepius. They were valued medicinal plants to Native Americans who used it for snake bites and for increased lactation. Shepherd's purse has been called the most essential plant in all of the cruciferous family for its ability to stop bleeding. And finally, ground ivy, or creeping charlie, helps stop headaches, earaches, sinusitis, and it also moves the lymph system, which is why it's known for its drying and draining abilities. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.